Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, here's what I'm going to talk about. What is IUS? Its vision, the structure, the components, some drivers and examples. What are the payoffs and outcomes which have already been realized and which are certainly to be realized in the future? And then finally, again, based on that, why we are here. I begin with the vision. IUS has as its vision these seven goals to be satisfied by one system from climate, maritime operations, improving forecasts of natural hazards and their mitigation, improving national defense and homeland security, minimizing public health risks, preserving and restoring healthy marine ecosystems, and sustaining living marine resources. All of that to be supported by the data and products of one system. In that context, IUS has both a regional and a federal footprint. The federal takes care of the global aspects of this for us. The regional takes care of the coastal. That allows for both local connection and connectivity with regional stakeholders and, and, and building and entrained and educated constituency, while it also ensures national consistency. As Laura mentioned, we have uh, this regional presence is via 11 regional associations, uh, kind of liaised with by a national federation of regional associations. In this area, the regional association is NANUS. And also federal agencies also contribute to IUS, and all of this is uh, managed, uh, at least by the RAN, by the NOAA IUS office. These are the 11 regional associations around the country. Laura mentioned AUS up in Alaska, and here in the Pacific Northwest, we are NANUS. Uh, all of these regional associations are coordinated nationally by the, Na the US IUS office, and we're pleased today that the director of the U.S. IU's office has joined us. Stenka Willis, would you please raise your hand or stand up for us? <laughs> Thank you, my friend, for coming here today to see this. Uh, there are also uh, some 19 federal partners that are also engaged at various levels of effort with, with this IO system, and we're so pleased. And I personally thank you, Laura, for your strong endorsement of, of IUs from the National Weather Service. That was wonderful to hear. Uh, IUs itself is a, a, a system of systems consisting of observations, uh, distributed data management and communications, modeling analysis and products, education and outreach, and again, stressing the fact that all of those are prioritized and driven by our users. Graphically, this is what it looks like on the bottom are all the various ways of observations themselves, which are seamlessly stitched together uh, by a data management and communication system, again, with national consistency and regional flavor. Modeling and analysis systems to ingest, was, as Rob mentioned, are going to be inherently sparse data, extended spatially and temporally with models and then putting out products. And then the various I use products and services at the end, tailored or driven by the user community itself. Uh, just going through that listing, observations is a uh, plethora of various types, aviation-born, satellite-born, ship-born, buoys, um, gliders, coastal radars, and the like make up just some of the various ways that data is uh, acquired for, for the IUS enterprise. Then once you get the zeros and ones off an electronic measurement system, it's turned into some geophysical parameter. Those are then uh, uh, quality controlled and put into various types of, of products with, via the data management and communication systems that delivers the data to users. And finally, we, we, we have a strong component of education and outreach because, first of all, the, the necessity of an informed constituency to drive this process forward, both nationally and regionally, is paramount. And we need to make sure that our children uh, are, are fully informed about the necessity of having a competent ocean observing system for them and their children. Um, looking at some of the drivers that, that drive this, I'm just going to go through some examples. I'm going to go high level to, to specificity. Uh, marine operations, which is a powerful component in the Pacific Northwest. We are a maritime region of the country with strong connections to the global economy and the Pacific Rim three, uh, via ocean trade. Uh, I use in the data promotes safe and efficient marine operations, supports Coast Guard search and rescue, and informs offshore energy planning and operations. 
looking at some examples. The Coast Guard clearly has a need for uh, quality data and prognostic data for search and rescue operations. Some of those data come from uh, high frequency phased array radars on the coast and Oregon has a very excellent example of that run out of Oregon State with Mike Cosro. And then taking those data and ingesting in the various types of models that can then be utilized uh, on a regional scale to provide products in this case for uh, wave uh, danger or search and rescue operations. Climate, the same kind of thing. The integrated ocean observing system serves to support the regional uh, climate status and trends, why is that? Because climate change in an ocean sense is gonna impact humans as a species where the ocean meets, spe uh, meets humans, and that's in the coastal regions. Uh, we also provide national climate experts with our regional measurements and provide coastal communities with more accurate estimates of trends. Uh, as an example, with climate change, marine ecosystems are highly sensitive to climate variation. Uh, an example of um, I guess I would say collaboration. We can use uh, various types of ocean acidification sensors on, I will call them buoys of opportunity, and certainly in NANUS, uh, the collaboration with PMEL is an excellent example of that. And then taking those types of data out uh, and, and again, extending them spatially and temporally so that a region can understand the connections and the teleconnections between its local environment and what happens on the global, on the global scales. Ecosystems, fisheries, and water quality, what do we do there? Certainly we're there to min minimize potential harm from harmful algal blooms, hypoxia, both regional threats here on the West Coast, as, as is ocean acidification. Uh, the data can support ecosystem-based management. It can support the protection of drinking water supplies. Part of the thing we're talking about here, of course, is that the Great Lakes is part of this national IU system, and, is, and it can also assist public health officials and others via easy access to data access. As an example, speaking of drinking water, some 40 million people depend on the Great Lakes for their drinking water supply, and the Great Lakes are part of this, of this enterprise. So what do we do there? Well, we have various water quality monitoring buoys that can measure water quality both in the Great Lakes and in our coastal oceans. And then we can put out products here looking at something like a red tide or a harmful algal bloom, all of which are informed and enabled by the IUS system, that is, data to communications to products to put out a warning for people. Coastal hazards, clearly uh, we are well aware of that, uh, what has happened in Japan and then the implications and the actions of the tsunami here on our west coast. But for coastal hazards, we support the Coast Guard against search and rescue as well as promote uh, um, safe and efficient operations and warn people about this type of thing. We're here on the west coast, clearly the, the, uh, the impact of ocean waves, winter storms, and the gradual uh, erosion of this has a profound effect on lives and property. Uh, IUS can go out and actually measure uh, changes in that and then model uh, the impact of, of local waves or distant waves from a tsunami. Uh, here's an example of NANUS where that, you'll hear more about this later, where, where those types of data can be made available to the public in easily accessible forms, and this is clearly a life or death kind of uh, product uh, as far as its implications are concerned. Coastal and marine spatial planning, get you to the end of these drivers if I might. Uh, again, supporting uh, all of these kinds of different operations to, in this case, inform offshore energy planning and operations, uh, which will allow for multiple uses of a marine environment while minimizing potential conflicts, uh, observations here on the East Coast, using our AUVs and ROVs to survey the actual oceanic environment, and then put together a product like this which uh, allows various users to access via GIS technologies where the different types of legitimate uh, utility or utilization of the marine environment are best suited for, in this case, uh, wind energy extraction off, off on the coast. All of that was a very rapid flyby of what I hope will be increasingly clear for the rest of the day of what the payoffs of, of IUS are, why you are, in fact, here today. This allows for increased efficiencies of data access. It provides local connections with national coordination. There's a tremendous amount of leveraging. You'll hear more of that in, in Jan's talk in a, in a minute, as well as providing linkage of existing assets into this system, much along the lines of what Rob was talking about, one-stop shopping, where it doesn't really matter where those data are coming from. 
Uh, the outcomes uh, that we are aiming for here are to improve the economy, of, of first of us as a nation and hopefully the world, uh, by unlocking the economic potential and business benefits of the ocean. Safety, as I mentioned here a couple of times, to help ensure our, our citizen safety, security, both on the coast as well as at sea, and environment. Uh, I use, and the data therefrom is key to protecting our environment for future generations. Uh, looking at the economy here, just some examples of how IUS can do that. Shipping routes uh, on the, from the global sense, the teleconnections between the ENSO monitoring and the Parada monitoring arrays in the Pacific have a direct impact on the long-term seasonal trends for people in Iowa who need to know whether they should plant cotton or soybeans that year. Those are driven by the interconnectivity of our planet. Uh, Offshore energy facilities can be best facilitated by these data, and certainly things like tourism and marine recreation, if you've got those kind of economic drivers, they'll also depend on accurate and timely data. Uh, the environment seems to be fairly self-explanatory, but just quickly, we need to understand what the, uh, the impacts of climate change are. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, insults to the environment, uh, as Laura mentioned, such as Deepwater Horizon. We need to know where those trajectories are going to go. Uh, even things like groundings here in the, in the Columbia Bar, wherein tidal heights and density differences have a profound impact on the decisions of when to cross that particular stretch of water uh, to prevent grounding of very large tankers going into Portland. As well as uh, that last one here, toxic algal blooms, again, a powerful problem on our coastal regions and now unfortunately making its way into some of our urbanized estuaries out here in the Pacific Northwest. Safety, um, obviously b better weather. Laura did a superb job in, in, in explaining how uh, understanding the ocean environment, the heat engine of the planet enables better weather predictions, including hazardous weather. Search and rescue clearly are going to be benefited by having accurate data. And on the homeland security or national security, IUS is part of the common operational picture that's going to make sense to military and Coast Guard people that just understand it's necessary. The environment is a venue through which all the other information passes. So finally, why are we here? We're here to educate and inform you and to be educated and informed by you. Especially important today is those of you who have not yet been part of this enterprise. Thank you for coming. It's important that you're part of this. We need to hear from the users, as I mentioned earlier, both to understand what they're doing and how we're doing is helping them, as well as what we need to do to do it better. That has a secondary benefit to us. To those of you who are not yet entrained in this process, I want you to hear today how important it is to us that we are, in fact, user-driven. And finally, for those agencies, state, local, tribal, and federal, and their regional components, if you're not yet engaged with us here in the Northwest, please do so. And do so by understanding that by becoming part of this colloquium, this collaborative enterprise, we can increase the efficiency of your operations, we can increase the economy of how you do business, and, and we can do this in a collaborative fashion by leveraging what already exists. Thank you very much. This has been the overview. For the rest of these talks today, we're going to drill back down into that, and to begin that for the Pacific Northwest, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend, my colleague, and the Executive Director of NANUS, Jan Newton. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. So um, it's my pleasure to be the second um, batter in our, in our three-part uh, presentation here. And so David gave you an excellent view of, of what IUS is all about and the national scale. And you saw many national examples. What I'm really going to focus on with you now is delivering observations in the Northwest region. All right, so you saw this slide, and it was much more conceptual. I want to make it be real and specific to our region. Um, the consistent national capability that these regional associations can give to a national perspective just makes so much sense. But this is the part that I'm going to concentrate on you with now, is how NANUS, a regional association, engages with local and diverse stakeholders, and that is who you all, many of you in this room, really represent, and, and that's my message to you. All right, so first of all, this is the NANUS region. Um, 
It's beautiful, and it's also quite diverse. We have, we have urban harbors like Puget Sound and the Columbia River with a lot of maritime trade. We have more rural um, and open coastal um, environments on, the, on our outer coasts of, of Washington, Oregon, and, and Northern California. Very different environments. We also have an enormous number of very real, sustained human interactions with these environments. Humans are part of this ecosystem. This is not distinct. We have long legacies of tribal, industry, and recreational folks who are harvesting and being sustained by our um, natural resources, as you see, shellfish. Some of our um, um, conditions offshore are some of the most um, uh, dangerous out there, um, as you can see by this Coast Guard vessel. We have very active geological processes in our area, as you see um, by that, that lower graphic and the, and the communities perched there. And the other element there showing the, um, the girl interacting with the fish trap is, is that we're in this ecosystem together, and it is our um, um, understanding, our common understanding of how best to nurture it, that we truly nurture our nest. So this is the diversity of the Nanus region. Um, but we also have the fortunate um, opportunity to use a lot of very exciting techniques, as you've been hearing about and as many of you are involved with, technologies that give us insight to those, those regions. Um, the coastal HF radar um, that we have along part of the coast, primarily in Oregon. Um, buoys and, and, and gliders, um, this, this one happens to be off of La Push. But the one thing that I want to emphasize is that when we do things, we don't just do one item on a buoy. This one happened to be funded by a foundation through the University of Washington. We've partnered with NOAA PMEL to put their sensors on them. There's also an autonomous glider that goes around the buoy. We've partnered with the Pacific Ocean Shelf Tracking System to put um, receivers that detect salmon migrations. So we're really making an integrated ecosystem system level observing system and optimizing the information we get out from that. This is our goal. And of course, the, the, the diverse techniques that we have for understanding our shorelines, and this is one of Nanus's early successes, was that the state of Oregon and the state of Washington, through two state agencies, DOGAMI, the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries and the Washington Department of Ecology came together and instead of just doing things their own idiosyncratic way said, let's do this in a common manner so that we can make assessments along the coastline together. So we've already had some really good success stories, but the question that faced us as we started to stand up NANUS is, how do we d deliver observations to the Northwest region? What and for what purpose? By whom and how best? Okay, those are challenging questions. This is, this is not a trivial item. Well, what do you have to start with? You have to start with the people, right? So that engaging with our diverse local stakeholders. I know you can't read this, but what this represents is the, at present, 45 member governing council that NANUS has um, um, engaged with and who have signed our memorandum of agreement. And I just want to put a plug in that if you want to be a NANUS member, it is free, <laughs> it is legally non-binding, but it does require your signature and memorandum and agreements are in the back of the room. Amy Springer there can help you with one. And you can be part of our governance structure. This governance structure is real. This isn't just happenstance up here. These are people who attend meetings and give us input, help us to define priorities. These are color-coded because I wanted to show the diversity. We have industries, we have tribal as well as federal, state, and local governments. We have nonprofits and we have academic and research institutions. And uh, you know, sometimes you've heard IUS is being libeled, oh, it's just an academic exercise. It is not. It is very, very well integrated. And certainly here in Nanius, we are extremely proud of that. That group of individuals and the governance structure that we've worked out in a democratic fashion with representational um, executive council have helped uh, 
they help us every year we write a proposal, identify where are our priorities. Nanus doesn't want to recreate the wheel. We don't want to do things that people are already doing. We want to be that glue or that, that, that helpful bit that can take a, a need and get it in a way that's going to serve one of our stakeholders, one of our members, in a way that's more efficient and more effective, okay? That takes everybody's input to identify it. I might not come up with the right idea, but those 45 people definitely will. This list that David went over, maritime operations, ecosystem impacts and assessments, fisheries, biodiversity, coastal hazards, and climate, was in the very first um, multi-year proposal that we submitted to the National IUS office. And it had that very quote in there that these were the issues having the greatest impact on Pacific Northwest citizenry ecosystems and that we believed were amenable to being substantively improved, okay? So that was the real message there. We can start to make a difference. And, and we rely on our governing council every year to keep giving us feedback. How are we doing on these things? And these are high level words here. And this afternoon, you're gonna be hearing examples, some of which we've done, and, and we want your ideas for where are the places that we should go. All right, so we had two strategies. They're pretty easy integrate what we have. Um, and that doesn't mean just the widgets, that means the people, that means the technologies. So, so let's, let's bring together what we have. We've been mentioning partnerships all morning and we thrive on partnerships. I don't think partnerships are something to do just because budgets are tight. I think partnerships are the right thing to do regardless of the budget because that's where you get the synergies, that's where you get the good cross-fertilization of ideas, that's where you get the efficiencies. But just what you have isn't always what you need. <laughs> um, so we have to be strategic about what else we need. And we link those back to those priorities, okay? That's a cycle that's really been working well. So NANUS has done this. And here's a perfect example of being integrating what we have in a full sense. You'll notice that there are two, two different um, logos up here and my clicker doesn't work. The first one is NANUS, you can see that up there. The second one is OOI, that stands for the Ocean Observatories Initiative. OOI is a um, program directed by the National Science Foundation, another very major ocean observing initiative. I use, you've heard about. They are both going to have assets in our region. These should not be two pillars going on independently, and we have not. We have meetings together. This conceptual model was drafted together. We are not going to put buoys where their plan is for buoys. We are going to work together in citing these. We work together consistently to come up with the best plan based on the scientific input, the processes in our large marine ecosystem and the California current system that are gonna give us this underlying understanding of the system. All right, by doing that, that enables NANUS to be um, as efficient as we can. We always need more, we always request more than what we get that there's budget for, but we can really sharpen and hone in on, okay, you know what? There was no measurement off of La Push, Washington, and we went after that. And we went after it in a creative way. We went through a foundation, we leveraged the heck out of everything, but these are the kinds of things we can do. You can tell I have a lot of passion for this, but I think it's because the people in NANUS really care about this, and we want to do it in a way that, that makes sense. And when you start doing it and you get some success, it's really exciting. The other thing is that once you start doing this, you find out that you have a lot of friends that come out of the woodwork that say, wow, this is pretty cool. What this map is showing you are dots. Each one of those dots is an observing asset. They're color-coded, okay? Green, yellow, and red. The, NANUS, uh, me, the NOAA IUS office funds the RAs to do observations as well as all of those other um, um, services. And um, you can see that if there were green dots on there, that would be funded 100% by the, NANUS, the, the NOAA IUS office. Yellow is funded partially and red is funded 0%, okay? 
There are no green dots on here, but you see an awful lot of yellow and red dots on there because we've got people who have, you know, never even heard of Nanus, but they see the data delivery system that you're going to see in just a few minutes, and they'll say, wow, we want to be part of that. That's a great idea. So we're already integrating these things. So this extreme level of leverage and linkage so that now you don't just go to one place to, to get one kind of data in another place, and Jonathan will tell you more about this, but you're seeing an overall composite picture. All right, how do we organize our people? People is what gets things done, right? And so people have different um, capabilities and perspectives. Um, so NANUS has established three standing committees in addition to our observational component. One is our data management and communications um, committee. And Steve Usakai and Emilio Mayorga, Steve from Boeing and Emilio from UW, are co-chairs of that committee in our audience with us today. Um, they lead an amazing team from, from a diversity of places, OSU, OHSU, state agencies, um, a team that works together on how to do all that data stuff that I don't have a clue how to do. <laughs> and David and I take great pride that we have no idea how to do that stuff. Um, we have another um, group, the Education and Outreach Group. And Amy Spranger in the back is our Education Outreach Specialist here in Washington State. She's joined by another person, Sarah Mikulak in Oregon. Um, and they collectively work together with another committee chaired by Nancy Hunter of, of um, um, Oregon Sea Grant who is working towards what are the education and outreach needs, okay? Then we have a third committee, the User Products Committee, and I'm going to be turning the floor over to Jonathan Allen from Dogami, who is the chair for that, who says, okay, you know, we've got this information and we've got these needs. How are we going to start delivering this information? What are these products? What do people want to see? Do they want to see it like this? Okay, so they each have different perspectives, but as you can see in the center that where it says TRICOM, these committees work comprehensively together. Some people are on one or more, or two or more committees. Every year they annually meet, they set, uh, they set priorities, they have an awful lot of communication, and it keeps it integrated and going. We think it's a great recipe for, for how we've made some progress. All right, so I've given you just a snippet on what, for what purpose, by whom, how best to do it. I'm going to just give you very quick examples. Jonathan's going to tell you a little bit more about them, but how best to get this out there. This is what we've done to date. We want your feedback on what we've done to date. We also want your ideas on how to make it better. The first thing is our website, or I guess I'm supposed to say web portal. I don't know the difference, but I know that one is bigger. But anyways, um, so this is a Nanus website, and it is your entry point. From here, you can get everywhere. Um, those little turquoise things across the top are our priority items. They're hyperlinked. If you click on those, they have theme pages to say like ocean acidification. And it's not just our ocean acidification page. We link to the NOAA PMEL and we link to um, the shellfish industry information on it. So, so we really have the capacity to build from one portal a lot of information. Um, some of our noteworthy things, the NANUS visualization system, I'll mention in a minute. Um, our memorandum of agreement right here. You can download it and sign it if you don't do it here. Um, and so this is our, our website. The NANUS visualization, ship, um, visualization system, NVS, as um, we're supposed to call it, is our pride and joy. And I'm not going to say anything more about that because that's what Jonathan will introduce to you. Um, but it's how you access and visualize the data. We have also had the pleasure and the honor to work with several groups to tailor a user product to a specific need. This is an example. We worked with the uh, um, National Estrin Research Reserve System and Kathy Angel through the Coastal Training Program here in the state of Washington Department of Ecology did a lot of outreach to the shellfish grower industry and said, okay, you need real-time data. What format do you want it in? Do you want it in Fahrenheit? Do you want it in Celsius? How, you know, what's the time record you want? And so work together to optimize the data that you can get through our NVS system as well as in a specifically tailored application. 
one quick example. We've also given a lot of thought into how do we deliver this. Okay, not everybody sits in front of a computer. Unfortunately, I spend more and more of my time that day. But you know what? The people who are interacting with the environment, they may be on a boat, they may be on a shoreline, they may be on a dock. And more and more, we have these wonderful mobile applications, these Androids and iPhones, and, and Nanus working with that wonderful DMAC team has put together these apps that um, you can get, they're free, and you can access the data, you can, you can scroll through these graphics, and you'll hear more about those. For people who are on the move, first responders, they don't want to be calling, hey, can you log on to your computer? It's right there in their hand. And lastly, um, learning tools. If we do not educate society, if we do not educate the next generation, we're, we're, we're missing the point. And so NANUS also works with our regional scientists and information givers to collect information and to produce some useful learning tools. We have lesson plans. We even have a competition for teachers to send us lesson plans right now using NANUS data so that they're engaged in this. Um, we have videos that, that lead people through how does hypoxia happen, what are some of the processes. So, so these learning tools are another important endeavor. So in summary, that's, that's making NANUS regional for you here in the Pacific Northwest. And um, that's what we're doing to date, um, very briefly. But I need to conclude my talk with one really important aspect of, of, of NANUS, and it, and it really tied with, with what both of our um, keynote um, speakers, Laura and, and, and John, um, in both his words and, and what he has heard Kevin say. And that's to explain to you the NANUS logo. You know, this isn't even really a logo. This is a work of art. It was drawn for us by a Shimshin um, tribal member, Tom Guthrie, he used to work at the University of Washington. And this is three, four critters to the, the Pacific Northwest. Um, the one, I always like to start with this one, with the teeth on the bottom. See that hole there? That's a blowhole. That's an orca, a toothed whale, okay? And um, the orca is the protector of the ocean. The one to its left, it also has teeth and it has a long, thin head. That is the wolf. That's the protector of the land, all right? Up on the top, there are actually two birds. One has a hooked beak and one has a smooth beak. The hooked beak is an eagle. That's the protector of the sky. The one on the left is the raven. And in much of the, the Salish and Pacific Northwest um, um, tribal lore, the raven is the trickster. And from my perspective, listening to Tom and his ex explanation, to me, that's entropy. That, and the red circle around this is the ecosystem. See, there's a red circle around all four of those critters. He said, that's the ecosystem. And at the center are the water waves. He said, I kind of think that's what you guys are doing, isn't it? <laughs> and so, so that circle of protection, that understanding of that very connected ecosystem, this symbology for Nanus is real, and I think we're putting it into practice, and it's my honor to be able to explain Tom's art, but also to give you a tiny snippet into Nanus, and I'm going to conclude now and turn it over to Jonathan Allen to tell us about how we're delivering the data to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. So I have the pleasure of uh, talking a little bit about uh, visualization, which is kind of ironic because I'm a sand guy and uh, <laughs> spent a lot of time pounding the beaches and, and yet um, have uh, worked with a, a core team of, I, I should say, the privilege of working with a core team of folks within Nanus who have actually uh, been instrumental in integrating a lot of the different data sets that we have out there and, and uh, developing the platform uh, that we see today in terms of uh, delivering information to, uh, to folks. So what I'm going to talk about is um, a little bit about where we were uh, a few years ago and uh, uh, where we're at today and uh, some insights in, term in terms of where we might be going uh, down the line in the future. And, you know, we've heard so far today that, uh, you know, one of the key uh, components of, of IUS and, and NANUS in general is 
uh, the acknowledgement that you know, several years ago, a decade ago, um, access to information was being accomplished through multiple venues, multiple data streams, uh, multiple sites. And to be honest, it was actually for those who are, are, are uh, uh, not well versed in, in, in finding information, it, it's a challenge for folks, uh, particularly the public at large. And so um, really in terms of trying to uh, integrate all those different data streams and, and develop a platform for, uh, for making them available, that was a, a core focus for uh, our team of folks. So um, a key need then is to be able to you know, seamlessly deliver all these different types of uh, data products from both uh, open ocean, estuarine, uh, terrigenous sources, things like that, uh, throughout the nano domain integrating across uh, both uh, um, cross-border, so working with folks up in Canada, uh, as well as within adjacent uh, regional ocean observing systems uh, uh, in the south and, and up in the Gulf of Alaska. And that's quite a challenge when you think about it, drawing together all these different uh, types of data streams that are out there. Uh, NANUS currently provides access to something on the order of 40, uh, 40 to 50 uh, different types of variables. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the different types of parameters, the waves, the winds, uh, you name it. Uh, and in total, we're actually serving something on the order of 160 um, assets, and that includes both models uh, as well as uh, gliders and uh, other uh, in-situ expand radar and things like that. So it's a, a tremendous suite of, of uh, data variables uh, and uh, in-situ assets uh, that are available throughout the Pacific Northwest, all in one um, type of visualization system. The overall goal here obviously is to uh, improve uh, people's awareness uh, in terms of situational awareness of, of conditions. Uh, that's obviously very important. The National Weather Service features very highly in this particular area. Uh, and it's critical to operations of many, uh, many organizations uh, that serve the public out there. So improving access and understanding uh, of these different types of environmental conditions is also a critical uh, element with what we try to do. And obviously, uh, over the short to long term, building up the, uh, the data streams, uh, both uh, short term, long term data series, uh, is, is absolutely paramount in terms of our understanding of the, the short to long term changes that we witness along our coastline. So these are the overall goals um, towards ultimately improving our understanding of climate variability, safety, uh, particularly in the Pacific Northwest uh, with our extreme wave environment, operations in order to um, accomplish day-to-day -day activities, uh, and then critically improving uh, resource management for those state agencies and federal agencies that have uh, important roles in these particular areas that hopefully, in, in, uh, when, when brought together, will help in terms of overall regional productivity. So that's kind of the overall sort of visualization of, of where we were um, several years ago in terms of trying to integrate all these, these um, uh, different types of data streams. The challenge obviously is, as we see in this room here today, is that you know, clearly there are many, many different stakeholders out there and every one of us have different needs and uh, uh, in terms of being able to access information of, of particular types. And, and that's quite a challenge for, um, for us as a team trying to figure out ways in which to actually make these data available. So uh, through a lot of sort of visioning um, in the early years uh, and um, discussions with, with multiple folks, um, you know, it, we identified sort of critical elements that would actually form the backbone for the NANOS visualization system. That is, we need to be able to seamlessly deliver information. Uh, it must be accurate. Uh, it must be of sufficient temporal spatial resolution uh, to meet all those different uh, user needs. And, and clearly, ultimately, the final step, meeting individual needs or agency needs. So within that, that sort of scheme of things, we identified sort of four key uh, requirements, uh, interoperability uh, at both regional and national level scales as well as at the global level. Um, we must have a reliable mechanism for ingesting uh, the suite of data that's out there, and then obviously developing the, uh, the tools and mechanisms for making that available through models and applications and so on. And so based around that, we settled on a, essentially a very uh, simple uh, interface, a Google Maps type portal um, that uh, resolves, revolves around really three core components. Uh, that is providing information on current conditions, uh, making uh, daily forecasts or forecasts out through several days available, 
uh, and then obviously access to historical data. And it's the latter, the latter point there that is uh, an area that we're actually working on uh, as we move forward in time uh, here on. Jan showed this image uh, earlier, and it just highlights the, uh, the ARCUs that we, we are developing uh, within the Pacific Northwest. Um, obviously, there's a, a federal backbone here, which is based around the NDBC buoys, the National Ocean Service uh, tide gauge stations that are strewn along our coastline. Uh, but there's also other parameters, you know, the satellite-based imagery that's being collected for the Northwest. And so the challenge was actually how you go about integrating these uh, widely disparate uh, data sets and data streams into, into one mechanism. What we settled on was uh, um, this uh, really quite neat interface, the, uh, the NANUS visualization, visualization System, or NVS, and um, uh, it's based around uh, you know, multiple uh, assets um, with uh, key icons uh, indicating the types of instruments or, or payloads that are out there. Uh, ocean observing type ones, uh, land-based systems, and things like that. Um, and there are multiple parameters that are being presented and uh, made available through this type of, of system. I'm also showing as a backdrop here is a, a composite one-month uh, satellite imagery of uh, water temperature um, over the past month here in the Pacific Northwest, and not surprisingly, it's all cold. Um, so there's nothing terribly interesting to, uh, to identify there. But it, it just highlights this capability of being able to uh, visualize and overlay multiple types of uh, data streams in one, uh, one portal. And, and this was something clearly we never had before. So this is my one complicated slide. <laughs> and I just put this up here just to actually highlight the complexity of the NVS system and the mechanisms that are being uh, utilized to try and deliver information to your desktop um, anywhere in the country. Uh, and I mean anywhere in the country, whether you want to access it by uh, mobile applications from smartphones or through web portals. But ultimately it starts with the data assets that are out there in the ocean delivering information uh, via a harvester that goes out and sucks in that data processes it um, based on a database, uh, and then it's being delivered through a portal um, or through other types of uh, delivery systems, and then ultimately reaching your smartphone or your uh, desktop. So it's a very complicated process, and there's a lot of different elements that are, are being, or that are coming into play uh, through this, this process. And over the, uh, the years, we've actually built in mechanisms that as one part of the system fails, um, someone is immediately notified through their cell phone that we can then go back and try and identify where that problem is. So there's some redundancy being built into the system as well to try to alleviate downtime, which you know, periodically does happen. So within the NVS systems, uh, you have, uh, again, access to multiple information. Here's an example. This is uh, showing WaveWatch 3 forecast, um, highlighting a very uh, strong storm system. Uh, you have uh, vector arrows showing directions of, uh, of wave, wave uh, angles. Um, these can be actually all in, uh, individually turned on or off. You've got access to individual sensors. In this case here, um, this is a, a profiling uh, buoy in Car Inlet uh, in Puget Sound here. And you have access to multiple uh, variables. Uh, and in this case here, multiple depths. This is uh, oxygen concentration at uh, multiple depths at one particular location. And you can obviously access information over short time periods, 24 hours, uh, seven days, 30 days, and we're actually in the process of bringing out a, a 60 day time series uh, very shortly. And the other element that will be uh, arriving on the scene in the not too distant future is actually a, a time slider bar which allows you to access a much longer time series, uh, which may be of, of much greater use to, uh, to folks. On the left here, you've got access to the in-situ assets. Um, you've got uh, cruise information, uh, gliders. Uh, there's information about the status of the buoys here shown. For example, green uh, indicates that the, uh, the buoy is online. Uh, the the, the uh, shape of the pie there indicates when the last observation was taken, whether it's up to date. Uh, if the system is down for some reason, it turns red. You know, there's all these types of uh, very useful information that's being uh, available to folks in, in one uh, location. I should also point out there's other critical things like uh, linking directly to the specific providers of those uh, buoys. Uh, you can click on that and it'll tell you who that person is or where that website is. 
Uh, there may be also information about within the details tab about the status of that particular instrument, whether it's down or it's, whether it's been updated or modified in some fashion. So there's a, a tremendous amount of information that's being uh, disseminated through this particular portal. Another really neat component, here's an example. This is a, a federal asset. This is an NDBC buoy, Stonewall Banks uh, buoy located offshore from Newport on the central Oregon coast. Um, here we're actually integrating as a backdrop. This is the uh, North American mesoscale model um, showing wind patterns across the Pacific Northwest. Uh, wind speed vectors are shown and strength of the uh, wind speeds are shown in the um, scale bottom, uh, bottom scale down here. Um, at the particular buoy station, we're uh, providing information about the current uh, wave conditions uh, at this particular, sorry, this is wind, wind conditions at this particular location. And this is actually in the uh, comparator uh, tab where we're actually overlaying information or model information for that particular site. And it's being updated on a daily basis as the model is improved, as more information is being uh, provided there. We can see the, the level of skill of the model in terms of uh, predicting uh, the conditions out through several days, uh, and it's changing, obviously, as, as the day goes by. So this is a, a pretty neat uh, uh, capability within the NVS system. Uh, you have access to other types of uh, numerical models out there. Uh, there's a high-resolution Oregon State University Wave Watch model, uh, which integrates much higher-resolution bathymetry. Uh, there's the uh, Pacific Basin Wave Watch model. It's operated by NOAA. So there's a lot of uh, other types of data sets and variables that one can access uh, through this particular system. Uh, another element is actually, uh, that presents challenges, obviously, is, is um, how you deal with uh, taking um, cars of, of uh, transit cars at particular locations. And this is based on prism cruises done in the Puget Sound region, uh, developing in a longshore plot of uh, changes in dissolved oxygen uh, at depth at different locations. And you can see uh, a particular area here down in the bottom of Hood Canal where uh, very low oxygen uh, levels are being achieved uh, compared with out in the uh, open Puget Sound region. So it's another tool uh, within the NVS system that can be accessed uh, by folks. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Uh, where we're going, we're, we're uh, and, and going back to my second slide, acknowledging the, the range of stakeholders that are out there, um, this obviously presents real problems for us because, you know, clearly NVS has reached a, a stage now where it's actually uh, fairly complicated in terms of the amount of information that's available to folks. So the, the approach we're taking now is to try to uh, develop more focused applications and, and so we call these NVAPs or Nanus Visualization Applications. And these are now being targeted at specific user groups. So for example, uh, two NVAPs that are currently available um, is the uh, Beach and Shoreline Mapping Portal. Uh, which I'll show a little bit about in a minute. Uh, and just recently we released uh, in November the Pacific uh, Northwest Tsunami Evacuation Zones, uh, providing information about inundation from both local and, and uh, uh, distant tsunami events. Other uh, portals that are actually in the making at the moment, uh, we're looking at developing a Maritimes uh, Operations Portal, a situational awareness where you actually will have current conditions of a particular parameters that may be of interest, uh, and then there are other more um, significant uh, developments, uh, such as the uh, uh, integrated data access system, allowing for uh, access to uh, much longer time series of data, being able to customize and, and develop your own plots and, uh, and comparisons of multiple parameters. And then also through collaboration with the uh, uh, CMOP, Coastal Margin um, uh, Center, uh, we're actually working with them to, through their data explorer to again, allow for more simplified access of multiple variables um, and uh, from multiple sites uh, through a simple uh, user-defined uh, portal. Here's an example, one of the NVAPs, this is the, uh, the Beaches uh, um, NVAP, uh, showing uh, in this particular case, these are stations along the coast here and down in uh, central Oregon, uh, showing a time history of changes, of, of uh, um, changes on the spit here, um, the current conditions in black, and eventually, you know, the, uh, the indications are that this particular site down through here will probably breach, uh, potentially opening up a hole into Neetarts Bay, uh, which could obviously have ramifications for, example, uh, the shellfish growing industry that's based in Neetarts Bay. So these are the types of things that could be delivered as well as longer time series of this particular location. I just skipped over one slide. 
The other really neat um, uh, portal that we've recently released um, is the, uh, the Tsunami Evacuation Zones. Um, this is uh, 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 through a collaboration between uh, my agency, Oregon Department of Geology, uh, the um, Washington Department of Natural Resources, uh, and NANUS, where we're, uh, as the agency tasked with developing evacuation zones, we're providing that information to NANUS, uh, and NANUS is able to take that information and develop a really neat um, portal for allowing folks to actually figure out where they are and whether they're in a tsunami inundation zone and things like that. So here's an example. This is Cannon Beach. You can do a search uh, by street address. You enter that in. Uh, based on the shaded polygons, it tells you whether you're in a, uh, an evacuation zone or an inundation zone associated with a, a local uh, um, Cascadia, which is the, uh, the bright yellow here, um, showing the maximum extent of inundation for this particular location versus a, uh, a more distant tsunami um, that may inundate a much, obviously a much smaller area. I point out that one of the, the neat things about this particular portal is that we're actually directly linked to the Alaska Tsunami Warning Center. And as, uh, as information bulletins are released through them, it's automatically being updated on the NANUS, uh, on the NANUS uh, portal. And here's a, an example where we had an earthquake 6.9 this morning uh, down near Vanuatu. Alaska Tsunami Warning Center issued a statement, uh, information statement saying that basically um, everything's okay, there's no tsunami uh, likely to be generated with this type of event, uh, everything's hunky-dory. So this is one of the, uh, the other sort of neat mechanisms uh, about this type of uh, interface. We can actually in bring in lots of different types of overlays, um, uh, identifying critical facilities. We can identify things like bridges. If you actually gloss over that little point, that will tell you that uh, be careful when you're planning your evacuation route. Uh, this bridge could be uh, uh, damaged in an earthquake. You know, things like that that people would not normally think about, uh, but we can actually provide that, that, that information um, through this, this type of portal. Other types of uh, um, information that's listed there, I mean, there's a, a really wide, a, a huge amount of information about pre preparation, uh, procedures for evacuation, how to respond in local and distant uh, uh, um, earthquake scenarios, and, and uh, information about where to go. So there's a tremendous amount of information here which um, uh, is now available, uh, or more easily available to, to the public at large. Significant amount of development and time and effort has also been directed at developing um, applications that are, are going to be able to or are available for smartphones. It's very clear that smartphone technology um, is really probably the way of the future and, and increasingly a lot of the information that we're seeing on desktop type applications will become more available through these types of uh, smartphone apps. So uh, Nanus released uh, an NVS uh, mobile application, basically analogous to the main portal, which has all those in situ assets. Uh, you can ab uh, you're able to obtain uh, direct information about waves, tides, you name it, um, at any point uh, along the coast or wherever you want to be. Um, and so you can, you can get access to that information very easily. In uh, November, uh, we released the Tsunami Northwest evacuation app. Um, for iPhones, and then uh, in January, just a few weeks ago, we released a similar version for the Android market. And so both of these are now available. Um, it basically emulates the, uh, the, the Tsunami portal. Um, it brings in that added advantage that when you're out there, you can locate yourself immediately. You can tell whether you're in the inundation zone or not, and you can obviously plan accordingly. I was saying to my boss earlier, um, it's quite uh, um, thought-provoking when you're actually standing out on the spit there and you locate yourself uh, on using that tsunami portal and you suddenly realize the area that you're in and area behind you that's going to be inundated. It's actually a, a real wake-up call and it makes you think about where you need to uh, go in the advent of such a, an emergency. So, you know, I, I, it's very clear that this type of technology will play an increasingly more important role in, in all our lives. And I'll just finish up by saying that Within this portal, it has you know, essentially every capability that you see within the actual main website um, is being emulated here. You can control uh, elements of, you know, in terms of backdrops. Uh, you can control the degree of shading uh, or transparency, things like that. You've got access to brochures, the PDFs themselves that are produced by the state agencies uh, responsible for that. Uh, you can turn on and off markers and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of, a lot of features within this particular tool that you can... Uh, manipulate and control and, and uh, utilize. 
So one of the, uh, the great things to see about a slide like this, which is, is attempting to capture the uh, usage trends of the Nanus uh, portal um, and, and website over the past several years, um, it's, it's great to see that uh, we're indeed growing. I, I'll point out that these black lines are sort of averages for those years there. And clearly you see a lot of spikes as, as uh, incidents happen um, along our coastline and it generates interest. And here's an example, March 11th, uh, we saw a very dramatic rise in the number of people uh, wanting to access the NANOS or NVS site in terms of trying to find out information, whether it be information on water levels or uh, the tsunami inundation zones or things like that. But the, the neat thing to see is that over time, uh, we actually are growing. Uh, we're growing slowly, but it's, it's happening and it's very exciting to see, uh, certainly in the last year or so, you know, a significant uptake in, in interest in, in uh, the NANU system. So it's, it's very encouraging in that respect. And I'll end there. Um, I just, again, just last comment. I mean, I think we've done a remarkable job in a very short period of time. I, I'm excited to, uh, to uh, see some of the potential future technologies that NANUs can actually uh, help and, and hope to utilize better. And I think um, certainly uh, providing we remain integrated um, and uh, are able to uh, maximize that to the best of our abilities, uh, I, I see some exciting new uh, opportunities and products for uh, the NANUS region as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. So stay up here. Okay, so we have time now for a panel. So I'm just going to ask the, the, um, the three of us. Jonathan, I just wanted to ask you to explain one last thing on here, which are those little arrows there. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mention that. So in addition to obviously uh, viewing and um, uh, viewing the plots themselves, and, and I, uh, two things I'll mention. One is if you click on that little, um, little uh, uh, magnifying glass on the bottom right hand corner, it'll pop you up into a, another page which shows a bigger image of that particular plot. And then the other components is that obviously you can actually download that information in a variety of formats by clicking on each of these little uh, um, bottom pointing arrows. Uh, in the longer term, uh, being able to access much longer time series is, is the direction that we're heading. And um, I, I'm confident that we'll be a, able to at least provide annual, if not maybe slightly longer time series in the not too distant future, which will be an exciting new development for NANUS as a whole. Great. So let's take our chairs over here. And um, we're right at 11.30, right on time. So we actually have about 20 minutes for a, a question and answer session, if you have one for us. Yes. The very last slide that you showed, your user statistics, given that you're focusing or you have a, a huge um, breadth of potential stakeholder users, do you know who is actually accessing the site? Have you started to get there, dig down into those statistics to see who it is you are serving? We're, we're, we're getting there slowly. That's uh, an area that we have been thinking about um, quite a bit over the last couple of years is to try to make a uh, better assessment of, of who our end users are. And, and you know, at this point in time, we're reliant on emails and traffic like that that uh, are informing us of things that may be breaking down, et cetera, and, and how they may be using products. Um, you know, we utilize, obviously, Google Analytics uh, to some degree uh, to make determinations about how much usage is going on, how many page views, very simple statistics. Um, but you're really limited in terms of, at least correct me if I'm wrong, but you're really limited in terms of, through those mechanisms, determining who the actual users are. You can only sort of locate them to, to general areas, and uh, you can't get down to the level of detail as to whether it's a fisherman or a resource manager or anything like that. That's another level of, of investigative work that, um, you know, it's a direction that we want to go and, and we're very mindful of it. And I know that IUS in general, in terms of making the case to Congress, etc., it's a critical piece of the, the, the puzzle um, to demonstrate that we are being successful or we're not. You know. um, let's see. Let's go um, Chris and then Chris and then there was another hand here. She picked and the guy you... with the tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I... As far away from you as I can get. 
Uh, the amount of information that you've pulled together is really quite amazing and impressive, but it uh, raises a question in my mind as a scientist of data quality. You know, you, you basically are pulling together all these data sets that you have no control over how they're done or the quality of the data coming in. Do you have some sense of how you might be able to do some quality control? I'll start on that and then others might want to chime in. Um, Chris, that's, that to me is the central question of, of this all. Um, the, the data we serve are the data providers, um, the data we serve are what the data providers are giving us. So it is only as good as what the provider gives us. Now, if Nanus is partially funding a data provider, we have um, agreed upon, you know, methods of, of quality assurance that we're working on sharing collectively across the group to do that. But if it's real-time data, it's real-time data. So real-time data, you know, can always have its pluses or minuses. And we do have those disclaimers on there. In terms of the, when we have our slider bar, then going able to go back and have those, those QA, QC procedures for the, um, the data providers, um, that, is, that is something we are doing as, as a Nanus organization. Now you notice we're also serving a lot of data from people who, who just say we would like to have our data part of your system. And that truly is caveat emptor. This is, this is something we really struggle with. And um, as a scientist, I think the scientist is going to need to know what they are going to allow into their analysis and do some extra work to see whether you want to use it. But I think that there are two strategies. I think one, and it depends on what questions you're researching, obviously. You may need the level of precision um, to the highest order for some of the research you're doing. Other times, you need to see more observations that allow you to see more of the picture in a comprehensive manner. And if you do have less precision, it may not affect the research question that you're asking so much. So it is a mix. And I know that, that the national office has been working. Um, there's Quartod, there's, there's all of these different acronyms, and I can never remember what the, the, the one du jour is. But this is, this is a huge issue. Charlie Alexander in Stanka's office is, is working on this. It's not an easy thing to do. But I think we either you know, stop providing people with real-time data. I don't think that's the way to go. Or we, we try to limit. And so our policy has been, it is caveat emptor. But it's, it's important. So um, I believe Chris Moore's, and then there was another um, over here. Question for Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, is there an explicit role for the value-added private industry to participate in making environmental information products within the present conception of their system? That's actually an interesting question. It's not something that we've really uh, um, discussed. I mean, obviously, I, I don't think um, there's any um, any prohibition against mm -mm. the private sector wanting to develop products that could uh, integrate with what we have here. Um, but it's not, you know, to be honest, it's not something that um, I think we've really thought about at this point in time. That sector plays a big role in meteorology, and so you anticipate, should anticipate this going to play a big role in, in operational geography too. Sure. And right. in, in the southeast, there are private providers of information who are very upset about what's, what's happening because they see their market being encroached upon by... So you, are you talking more about more the implications, are you talking more about the implications of the types of data we're serving and the impacts that it would have on private uh, um, entities that are trying to serve similar data? Or, or the or developers making, or they're products. providing? Sorry? Making, those companies that make products. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah, there's no, there's no prohibition or... or Adjunct against that, the uh, these for the most part are, are data which are provided by U.S. taxpayer dollars in general. Uh, those are provided. Uh, the American public can have access to those. And that's what we're doing. The the next step that you're talking about, going from that to AccuWeather, whatever that analog might be in the Northwest Pacific Ocean, I don't believe has occurred yet. But there's nothing preventing that if there's a market and an economic engine to drive such a product. My opinion is that ought to be explored. 
because it could be an important component of economic development. Yep. Would you like the weather service to comment on that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I should say something. We obviously have been struggling with this over the years, and not really struggling, but making sure that we have policies in place. And uh, one of the policies is the fair weather policy. That's our private public partnership policy to make sure that the information we have, the, the public can take and then add to it. So it's the value added that, uh, that we need as a part of building our weather ready nation. We have to have the private sector right beside us, I guess, symbiotically exploring our information and producing products that will help save lives and property. So it's definitely something I know the climate community is struggling with now as well. We have, um, uh, NOAA has a science advisory board and we have a response now that we need to respond to them in regards to the open weather and climate service. So how can we ensure that our information is available to the public and to the private sector so they can then um, continue to make a profit? So there is a, a fine line between what we're doing, but uh, we definitely need to maintain that partnership. The other thing I was going to mention is... <clears throat> um, we have to instill that partnership and um, make sure that we aren't infringing upon the, pu the private sector's ability to make a profit. Um, at the same time, there was a, a one key element I had there, and I, I just lost it. So, <laughs> Thank you. Fair weather. Yeah, the fair weather policy. We are updating um, the fair weather uh, policy. We're in the process of updating that. And uh, so that's that's the point I was going to make. So thank you. It's a partnership, and we have to continue to explore those avenues. Uh, to follow, I mean, is there a policy in, in fair weather you do something, and in bad weather you do something differently? That's just the name of the policy. It's the fair weather policy. So it's our public-private partnership. Has nothing to do with the actual weather. <laughs> the way I was going to respond to that is that. Uh, you need to have these relationships established before the severe weather comes so you can make sure that uh, the information is, is going out to the right folks. Another thing, what I was going to say was we have some individuals, some private entities that will give us the information. We do the quality control on it. And then by having that NOAA meatball on there or that NOAA stamp of approval, it actually makes the information more valuable for them to then take and do the value added information so we have a question over here um, yeah this is a, might be a follow-up question for that I'm a, I'm a developer for a private company and when I look at this I think it's great you got a lot of data on there a lot of data for somebody who's never seen it mm -hmm. and I think you're seeing that when you're doing your applications now that are more targeted and focused towards groups how can I get this data as a developer? I don't want the graphs, I want the data. Is there a way that I can pull this data into my application so you guys don't have to write every focused application? I'm sure there is. <laughs> but it's not. I'll uh, turn it over to my colleague Emilio Mayorga who's in the back there who may be able to better answer that for you. We can't hear you, Ed. Yeah. We'll, we'll need a microphone so, because we are recording this so it's very important for us to. Be obvious from sorry. So the brief answer is yes. We have data services that would do exactly what you are uh, interested in. Um, that wouldn't be apparent by just looking at NVS because the audience for NVS is users. Um, so talk to us. We have. Uh, I don't want to go into details here because of the diversity of the audience, but we have a couple of options. They're fairly new, and uh, we're still uh, careful because we have limited resources and we don't want to be flooded by a request that brings down our servers, but definitely talk to us. That's part of our mission. Make the data available, integrate it, and make it available. Thanks, Amelia. There's a question um, in the back and then one here as well. Uh, this question would be for Jan. Yes. Um, I represent the fishing industry at the federal level and uh, state of Oregon. and this information looks very encouraging to the fishing industry, and I guess there's no limit to how this could possibly help the fishing industry. My number one concern is it looks expensive, and I was wondering what threats 
more possible opportunities exist in the future for long-term funding of this process? This, you know, you guys are asking all the easy questions. Um, <laughs> data quality, data sharing, and, and, and long-term funding. So IUS was set up to be a sustained system. That, that was what Congress called for in 1999 and what was enacted in, in the um, authorization. Um, sustained federal dollars are only as good as federal budgets, so, so that's, 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 no easy, um, that's no easy nut to crack. Um, um, we uh, believe, we have faith, that the IUS program will continue, that this will continue to be part of the nation's um, um, effort going forward. We heard this morning some very strong um, statements about the importance of this. What will that funding level be? You know, Nanus's um, revenues each year are right around two, two, a couple million dollars. Um, will that float up to, to four or five where we could be doing a lot more? Will it regress to a million where we're gonna have some really, really tough decisions and, and I don't know what we're gonna do? I don't know, those are, those are our national questions to answer from our Congress, but I will say that part of engaging with you all is that you know you you speak to your Congress people, you speak to your um, legislators and the folks who make those decision policies. If we have things that that are making a difference in jobs and the economy and safety, and people hear about that and they hear that it is cost effective. That's, that's the kinds of things we, we need to hear about. And when David and I and others go back and we talk to members on, on the Hill, um, it's amazing. Both sides of the aisle say, yes, this is good. But you know our nation is in great uproar in terms of what to do about the economy. But they have to hear that this is important and that it matters to folks like you. It really is important. Just a few seconds on that. One of the reasons we've been striving so diligently for now off eight years with, with Nanus to, to build an informed and educated constituency is for that very reason, is, is to be able to carry a coherent message which is true and which speaks to the efficiency and the collaborative benefits of, of this approach to meeting uh, federal regional agency needs while serendipitously meeting the regionally focused needs of our people. Uh, this is we, what we believe is the most cost-effective way to do that. And so thank you for being here to hear that story and to hopefully carry it with you when you leave. And I will also add very quickly um, that it doesn't just have to be the feds funding this. You know, that's, that's another thing. If, if people think that this is an important idea, it, I think IUS was really thought of as public-private partnership. And so really trying to pull that out. Right now we have one funding source. But, but we could improve that base, and, and we have the means to, to have fiscal responsibility and, and ways to allocate that in a way that gives you the kinds of things that you want. So that's another business model that we should definitely be exploring. Stenka. So on the sustainability, I, I wanted to let you know a couple, couple key things in the progression uh, of USI use it. Yes, I do think it is sustainable. Uh, first, the legislation that was passed in March of 2009, it'll come up for reauthorization uh, in a year from now, and we're going to need everybody's support to get that reauthorized. It's important to have that legislation. Secondly, the program started as congressional earmark, and it really got the program going. But in 2008, it became part of the president's budget. And that is a, a big milestone to make it a sustaining program. Uh, the lead federal agency is in NOAA, and therefore there are two lines that you can see in the federal budget that talk at a national level for IUSE and at the regional level for the IUSE. And, it's, and I think it's very important to note that 75% of the funding for this program does not stay inside the federal agency, in this case NOAA. It comes out to support this regional uh, enterprise, which we are absolutely committed to keeping going and, and educating and advocating for how mission critical this is. This is not just a nice to have 
um, extramural research program that are critically important in the research perspective, but it's mission critical to the mission agencies, the Coast Guard, who relies on it for their search and rescue. And you heard from, from NOAA this morning and, and our other federal agencies, the Army Corps, who the, the uh, Bill Berkemeyer is here representing the Army Corps, and that sustained partnership. The other thing that you should know is that we now have opened a five-year partnership with all of our regions. It's not a year-to-year proposal process that we do. We are now in the second year, or well, this fiscal year, um, of a five-year um, partnership to show that commitment to, in this case, NANUS and the other 11 regions. So for those reasons, and we do are committed to the sustainment of this, but as Jan said, we need your support and in real terms of how it helps you from an economic perspective, a safety perspective, and helping you do what you do every day, because that's, you know, that's our, our mission. So thank you. I believe there's two more questions, one here, one over there. Thank you. Uh, Al Pizar, I, I'm here representing the commercial fishing industry from Oregon as a user group. Um, Question for Jonathan, great presentation, by the way. And by the way, you're doing a really good job with a $2 million budget, near as I can see. It's good stuff. Jonathan, you showed a slide. I think it was the Stonewall buoy with wave uh, actual. There was a blue actual and then a, a red line that showed the prediction, I think. That was the, actually wind speed. Wind speed, okay. I, I mis, yeah. mis, mis, misspoke. It um, was wind speed. Of the 47 or so parameters that you track, is there a prediction made for each of those? And, and if so, how many are, yeah, there it is, are accurate to some degree? Or, or are, there, are there some with, with less accuracy than others? <laughs> oh, you're shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> so to answer the first part, um, for most of the, certainly all the NDBC buoys, that I'm aware of, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Emilio, um, and any station that's showing meteorological parameters, there are both observational and model values for that location that are being derived from larger scale models. Uh, and, and in this case here, we're using the NAM model to provide um, predictions of wind conditions at that particular site going out over multiple days. But then the other neat thing about that is that over time, those predictions are changing based on trajectories of storms, et cetera. As the conditions are changing, the models are being updated and being reflected accordingly up here. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Uh, of the 47 parameters, how many have predictions? You know, I couldn't answer that directly, but as I say, mo you know, certainly all the oceanographic stations um, where the, the fundamental parameters, waves, uh, direction, um, frequency, winds, uh, pressure, things like that, there will be, for the most part, I'm pretty sure there are model predictions of those locations. But not all, not all 47 have, have uh, model results associated with or tied with them. The accuracy is the challenge. Um, I mean, you can clearly see in this case here, the, uh, the initial forecast made on the 29th um, had uh, fairly significant deviations relative to the measured. Um, but over time, as the system got closer to that location, the model estimates are improving. And so they're, 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 they're getting better. Um, but the actual accuracies, I couldn't tell you the, the numbers. I mean, that, that's something you have to dig down to look at the individual models themselves. Um, so we're relying on, in this case here, federal models. Um, so Wave Watch 3 or the NAM model. And there will be accuracies associated with those. But clearly, as time changes, they'll, they'll vary. There are a few uh, oceanographic readings that fishermen would really like to know about predictions. Uh, sure. There are model predictions for ocean upwelling. Um, we do make, uh, for example, we have a, um, a, a fishers uh, web page 
that provides um, information on the ocean circulation patterns, primarily temperature, uh, integrates ocean currents, and that's all being driven by a numerical model that was developed at Oregon State University, um, uh, Karapov here, uh, and um, uh, those are being you know, those models are obviously being fed by in situ observations at different locations to help calibrate that model. Let's uh, come back to this for the fisheries session because this is a really good topic, Al, and and, and I'm hoping that. Um, People can see there are three different weighted lines there. Each of those is a different um, day's prediction. And what Jonathan was saying is the one that's very fine wasn't as good. As time goes by, it gets better. Um, there's a, a, a question, Bill, and then Timmy, you had your hand up. Uh, Bill Burkmeyer with the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, two questions. Um, one sort of mechanical. This NVS, which I think I looked at when it first came out, and it's like really advanced from then. and and. Uh, is it transportable? I think, in, in, I mean, I don't know about the other regions, in, but it's the most sophisticated thing I've seen. And is it transportable, and is there interest in, in it? So the answer to that is yes, and again, I'll defer to Emilio in the back there, but um, yes, we have transported it, uh, the basic programming interface, to other regions. So very cool, and I'm interested in that. Uh, the other thing is the tsunami uh, prediction, because... This is where it looks like NANUS is actually doing something that the state, under state aegis or something. And so is that where people go in the state for their tsunami information? Is that like the single place? Which then puts NANUS, you got to be there because this is where people are going. So sort of what is, who's, whose role is that? And is that one that, that NANUS has now taken on, the official tsunami? We're not warning, no. Bill. So two answers to that. One is we're not warning people. Um, David's absolutely right there. We're just utilizing information from, in our case, uh, the primary warning centers, the Alaska Tsunami Warning Center, that feeds directly into our, our portal. Um, and we just provide that information, um, and folks can actually link to that particular site through the, the tsunami portal. The other component is um, the primary responsibility of all tsunami inundation modeling and mapping is... Um, the state agencies within Washington and Oregon, it's their responsibility. And in Oregon's case, it's the Oregon, my agency, Oregon Department of Geology. Uh, and we're in the process of actually uh, completely redoing all our tsunami inundation uh, evacuation maps for the entire Oregon coast, which were last, uh, which were done originally in the mid-1990s. And based on new earthquake source parameters, new technologies, we're updating those maps and we're making those overlays available through a collaboration with NANUS. And Washington DNR has a similar uh, approach as well. We got to be wrapping this up. We here. should be wrapping this up, but Timmy has the, the, the microphone. Uh, just a, a quick question. Timmy Van with NOAA. And uh, in recognition of the fact that we're at world headquarters of Microsoft and graciously hosted by Microsoft Research and, and saw a, a nice. Um, presentation by Rob Fotland on uh, some of the applications that Microsoft is uh, developing on the research and, and tech development side. I feel compelled to ask the three of you where you um, sort of see in the near term uh, areas of opportunity to collaborate with uh, lines of industry like Microsoft and whether or not it's on the data consumption side as they develop new and innovative uh, applications or if it also includes innovating sort of the next best thing. Timmy, that's an excellent question, and that is actually one of the very strong impetus for why we, we wanted to have this meeting here with Microsoft Research and explore with Rob and his team. Um, we will be largely exploring this um, tomorrow in a session, mm -hmm. um, tomorrow morning. But one of the things that, that, we, that we know that, that Microsoft Research has been doing is, is this two-way. Everything you're seeing here is very much one way, right? And, and we know that there's a lot of people, whether it's citizen scientists or, or just folks out in the field with observations, they want to be able to get stuff up there. So I think the, the sky is the limit for the kinds of, of um, developments that we want to do, but, but um, when we, through Ralph Rayner's leadership, we're exploring how and where to host this. Um, to, to be here at the guest of, of Microsoft Research um, was a strong impetus because we see that there's lots of potential here. 
So with that, I think I would like to thank our speakers, but also recognize that we are just telling you what so many of the people of Nanos have done. And I would also like to thank our host, Microsoft Research, because that is who is treating us to lunch right now. So thank you. We're adjourned for lunch. We'll see you again at 1. It's far too big of a question.